a top Democrat revealed this frightening plan to remove Trump from office. Democrats are engaged in a full-scale campaign to resist President Trump. This includes impeachment. But one top Democrat crossed a red line when he suggested this frightening plan to remove Trump from office. Congressman Tom Suozzi, DNY, was at a town hall event in his Long Island district when he was asked how far Democrats should be willing to go to resist the president. Suozzi suggested taking up arms and launching an armed rebellion. The New York Post reports. A Democratic congressman from Long Island implied that Americans should grab weapons and oppose President Trump by force, if the commander-in-chief doesn't follow the Constitution. Rep. Tom Suozzi made the remark to constituents at a town hall last week, saying that folks opposed to Trump might resort to the Second Amendment. It's really a matter of putting public pressure on the president, Suozzi said in a newly released video of the March 12th talk in Huntington. This is where the Second Amendment comes in, quite frankly, because you know, what if the president was to ignore the courts? What would you do? What would we do? A listener then blurts out, what's the Second Amendment? The left-leaning Democrat says, the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. This is an unthinkable suggestion from an elected representative. And when questioned about his remarks, his campaign doubled down on starting a shooting war with the president and his supporters by quoting Thomas Jefferson. The Post also reports. But the Suozzi campaign at the same time seemed to double down on the comments as they forwarded a line penned by Thomas Jefferson that called for armed resistance. What country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms, the quote said. Suozzi, who is a strong supporter of gun control, actually called on Americans take up arms against the duly elected government of the United States. It could lead to an assassination attempt on Trump. It's outrageous. If a Republican were to make such a statement as this, the media would be gorging themselves on their own self-righteousness about how the Republican Party is an extremist faction that doesn't believe in American democracy and is unfit to govern a great republic. But this incident will get nothing more than a passing mention on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, NBC and The New York Times. That's because the facts are inconvenient for Democrats and do not fit the narrative they are trying to shape. We will keep you up to date on any new developments in this story. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Adam Schiff decimated with just three brutal words. Former Secret Service official Dan Bongino went off on fraudster, liar Representative Adam Schiff, DCA, today following the latest release of FISA memos this weekend that proved the Obama deep state began spying on the Donald Trump campaign based on a fraudulent document paid for by Hillary, the DNC and the Obama FBI. This latest revelation is devastating and could lead to criminal charges against several Obama officials. Dan Bongino, I believe Schiff is a fraud, a liar, a disgrace. He's an embarrassment to himself, Congress, the country. Adam Schiff has been the lead hoaxer. He's been out on television now for a year looking in the face of you, America, and lying to every one of you in an effort to distract the entire country on a hoax Russia scandal. He is a fraud and should be called out as one. Apparently, Bongino is not a Schiff fan. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. After achieving 4% GDP, Trump makes another promise that'll have every American cheering. Folks, we can't stop winning. Now that Trump's economy has shocked all the so-called experts and hit a stunning 4.1% GDP, our America First president is promising more prosperity for America. When speaking with Sean Hannity on his radio show, President Trump vowed to start cutting the $21 trillion in U.S. debt. 
Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Alert, George Soros just got humiliated by his home country. This is brilliant. Hungary is issuing a warning to the world, don't trust George Soros. Megalomaniac billionaire George Soros has been kicked out of his home country. The Hungarian president is wrapping up a six-week-long anti-Soros campaign that featured billboards demanding, don't let Soros get the last laugh. In his native Hungarian, via the Daily Caller. The Hungarian government is attempting to crack down on the intricate web of charitable organizations funded by Soros with the true intentions of undermining the fabric of Western society. George Soros uses the same strategy across Europe and in America. The billionaire funds progressive organizations with the aim of sowing division to harm the social order and national economies. In Hungarian public life there is a single important element which is not transparent. Soros's mafia-style network and its agent organizations, explain the spokesman to Hungarian President Viktor Orban. Now, the Hungarian government is forcing some much-needed transparency on Soros-funded non-government organizations NGOs, by making the groups reveal their funding sources. The six-week campaign against Soros was launched after a series of public consolations where President Orban met with citizens to discuss Hungary's greatest external threats. Almost 1.7 million Hungarians took part in the consolation series with a staggering 99% of people agreeing that George Soros needs to be stopped at once. One of the elements of George Soros's plan is for 1 million migrants to be brought into Europe every year, explained President Orban's spokesman. The second element in the billionaire's plan would be a European asylum authority, which would seize powers in this area from the authorities of the member states. The Hungarian government has been fighting against the European Union which they are a member of to control immigration in their country. President Orban considers stemming Islamic immigration as a matter of national security, putting him at odds with other leaders of European Union member countries. President Trump follows in the steps of our allies in Hungary. George Soros is conducting similar operations in America and goes unchecked. George Soros is an evil man. He is no longer welcome in his home country, and he should not be welcomed in America either. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Alert, GOP official makes shock move to expose Obama's shadow government. James Comey may be the first member of the shadow government sent to jail. Rep. Rob DeSantis, RFL, the high-ranking Republican from Florida, has called on Attorney General Jeff Sessions to launch a massive investigation into fired FBI Director James Comey leaking of classified information to the press. Via the Washington Free Bacon. Rep. DeSantis is a member of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. He also chairs the National Security Subcommittee. Additionally, DeSantis has urged President Trump to fire all holdovers from the Obama administration who still hold a post in government. The congressman claims that Obama appointees are responsible for the torrent of leaks that have plagued the Trump administration and jeopardized our national security since before Trump took office. Rep. DeSantis' statements echo the accusation levied by President Trump earlier this month. James Comey leaked classified information to the media. That is so illegal. The president tweeted. Via Twitter. Immediately after James Comey was fired by President Trump for hurting the reputation of the FBI, he stole classified government memos and gave them to a friend with instructions to leak them to the media. One of the memos contained information with an alleged meeting between President Trump and the former FBI director where Trump expressed concern about the investigation into Michael Flynn. The memo was written by Comey while he was leading the FBI and is, therefore, government property. Comey illegally took the memos with him after he was fired. Additionally, 
Comey broke the law when he leaked the classified information to the press in a petty act of revenge after being fired. DeSantis claims that Comey leaked the memo in an attempt to force the Trump administration to appoint a special prosecutor. If you're violating laws in service of doing political warfare, that is just absolutely unacceptable, particularly for someone who held such a high position in the government, he said. President Trump is at war with the shadow government who are desperately attempting to prevent him from draining the swamp. We the people need to stand with President Trump and remind the crooks in Washington that we run things. The power held by non-elected and faceless bureaucrats violates the values upon which this country was founded. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Alert! Impeachment announcement rocks nation. Democrats have been trying to get President Donald Trump impeached ever since before he took office. That's what has made this recent announcement so surprising. The Daily Caller reported that Democratic Rep. Jerry Connolly just spoke out to warn his party that campaigning too hard on impeaching President Trump will cost them elections. Noting that Connolly is a harsh critic of Trump, CNN anchor Poppy Harlow asked if calling for impeachment is a step too far. Do you think that your fellow Democrats should be wary heading into the midterms of running too much on impeachment? Harlow asked on Wednesday morning. Absolutely. I believe that voting for a Democrat should not be seen as tantamount to a vote for impeachment. In fact, if it is, then I think we're gonna lose elections we otherwise might win, Connolly said. Even Trump voters agree in many cases that this president needs adult supervision, and that means Democrats. And they're willing to vote for Democrats or at least entertain voting for Democrats so long as we separate ourselves from the I word. This comes weeks after Democratic Rep. Val Green claimed that a Republican member of the House told him privately that he's considered impeachment for President Trump. I have actually had, and when you say what I'm about to say, people will wonder, well, who was it and when was it said? But I've actually had a Republican member who said, you know, I'm strongly considering impeachment now, Green said. And I can only say to you that my suspicion is that there are a good many others who believe that we've reached that point in our history, but it's a difficult bridge for some to cross. For me, it's really not about the difficulty as much as it is about the necessity to do something about an unfit president. Share this story if you do not want to see Trump get impeached. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Alert! Trump just discovered Obama and Lynch's massive felonies. Donald Trump Jr. met with Natalia Veselnitskaya, a Russian lawyer, right after President Trump was nominated. Trump's campaign manager Paul Manafort also attended the meeting in an attempt to get dirt on Hillary Clinton before the election. As it turns out, the Russian lawyer lied and did not know anything about Hillary. She wanted to talk about the U.S. adopting Russian children. It has since been discovered that Loretta Lynch and Obama wiretapped Paul Manafort's phone so that they can listen in on the conversation, according to Medium. It turns out that Natalia was there strictly to set up Trump Jr. and company. How do we know for sure that it was a setup? All you have to do is look at the evidence. Natalia was initially denied entry into the country. She couldn't get a visa. Lynch was able to get her in under a policy known as Immigration Patrol, according to CBS News. You heard right, Lynch knew why the lawyer was coming here and set it up so that she would be able to gain entry to the country without a problem. Obama knew that all of this was going on as well. After all, Obama's Department of Justice was headed by Lynch. In other words, that order more than likely came directly from Obama himself, as author Jack Posavihik explains. Here is where things get interesting. It turns out that there was one extra person in the room during that meeting with the Natalia. His name is Renat Akhmachin, and he is a Russian-American lobbyist. Renat works with Goldstone, who set up the meeting, 
and a couple of others for a group called Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS is the group that initially released the 35-page report claiming that Trump and Russia were working together to steal the election. The goal here was simple. Obama and Lynch got the politically inexperienced Trump Jr. to go to this meeting so that they could frame the Trump administration for the Russian collusion story that we have heard about every single day for almost a year. It would seem that the goal was to get everyone up and into a frenzy, and when the time was right, announce that Trump Jr. went to this meeting with a Russian lawyer that Lynch and Obama brought into the country. They seem to have forgotten that no information was ever exchanged. So what exactly was this collision about? Left-handed Democrats are trying to dismantle the Trump family, even though they are the best hope America has. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. All hell broke loose when a top congressman started talking impeachment. Washington insiders and pundits have been whispering about impeachment for months. Impeachment is starting to look more like a reality than just a rumor. And all hell is breaking loose because a top congressman dropped this bombshell about impeachment. Congressman Mark Meadows is the chair of the Influential Freedom Caucus. He has a direct line to Donald Trump. So everyone sat up and took notice when he stated that the impeachment of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was a possibility. Rosenstein stepped in and took over the Russia investigation when Attorney General Jeff Sessions recused himself. And he infuriated Trump supporters when he appointed Robert Mueller as special counsel to conduct a witch hunt against the president. But what has Congressman Meadows up in arms is the Department of Justice and the FBI's failure to produce documents that would explain their conduct in the Russia investigation. Since Rosenstein is overseeing this probe, their failure falls at his feet. And Meadows believes it is possible he could pay the ultimate price. The Daily Caller reports. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein could soon be held in contempt of Congress or even impeached if he fails to produce Russia and Clinton-related records to Congress, a top Republican lawmaker said Saturday. I think that if he does not turn over the documents, that there are a growing number of U.S. on Capitol Hill WHO believe that someone else needs to do the job. And what happens there is, constitutionally, we have some things that we can do, North Carolina GOP Rep. Mark Meadows said to Fox News Janine Pirro in a Saturday night interview. Meadows was responding to the Justice Department and FBI's failure to meet Thursday's deadline to turn over 1.2 million documents related to surveillance warrants granted against President Donald Trump's former campaign adviser, Carter Page, the Hillary Clinton email probe, and the FBI's internal report recommending the firing of former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. In his interview, Meadows identified Trump appointee Rosenstein as the main roadblock in producing the records. Rosenstein is acting Attorney General for the Russia investigation because of Attorney General Jeff Sessions' recusal from the matter. We have to have someone willing to do the job. If the Deputy Attorney General is not willing to do it and not willing to allow U.S. to have our Constitutional Oversight Authority supported, then we'll find someone WHO can, House Freedom Caucus Chair Meadows said. If they don't, provide the documents, how do you get rid of Rosenstein?" Pirro asked the Republican. The first area is really contempt of Congress, Meadows replied. One of the things we have as a tool in our toolbox is impeachment. Trump was furious about the Justice Department's inaction and tweeted his displeasure. By stonewalling the committee's requests, Rosenstein is participating in a cover-up. For Americans to have faith in the FBI, Citizens need to know that the Bureau's decisions are guided by their fidelity to the Constitution, and that the rule of law and their motives are not corrupted by political bias. Because of everything we now know about how the Russia investigation came to fruition, Americans' trust in the FBI as a nonpartisan defender of the rule of law has been shaken. For the FBI to recover, the whole truth, even if it is ugly, must be brought into the open and the guilty parties must be held accountable. Do you agree?
Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. All hell broke loose when one video of Hillary Clinton went public. Hillary Clinton just made the worst mistake of her life. She was asked a question about the 2016 election. And all hell broke loose when the video of her answer went public. Clinton appeared at the India Today conclave in Mumbai. When discussing the results of the 2016 election, Clinton spewed one of the most hate-filled answers anyone had ever heard. She described how she won the coasts where the populations are diverse and dynamic and represent two-thirds of America's GDP. Clinton declared that Trump won the middle of the country and smeared everyone there as poor, stupid, racist women haters who don't like blacks having equal rights or women holding jobs. Networks reports are stating, If you look at the map of the United States, there's all that red in the middle where Trump won. I win the coasts, I win Illinois, I win Minnesota, places like that, Clinton said. What the map doesn't show you is that I win the places that represent two-thirds of America's gross domestic product, Clinton explained. So I won the places that are optimistic, diverse, dynamic, moving forward. And his whole campaign, Make America Great Again, was looking backwards. You know, you didn't like black people getting rights. You don't like women, you know, getting jobs. You don't want to see that Indian Americans succeeding more than you are. Whatever your problem is, I'm going to solve IT, Clinton said, about people WHO supported Trump. It was a shocking display of hatred and bigotry. Her comments were somehow even worse than her famous basket of deplorables gaffe from the 2016 campaign when she claimed half of Trump supporters were racist deplorables. Here she slimed everyone in middle America as an ignorant bigot. Clinton holds hatred in her heart for half the country. It's no wonder she lost. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' news feeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Anti-Trump dossier just exposed, people are going to prison. As disgusting as this may sound, there are some people who just don't like President Trump, regardless of what he does for this country. The big question is, what happens when these people get caught up in their shady behavior? Amidst the controversy between an imaginary President Trump and Russia connection, a secret dossier repeating these claims came to light. Fox News reports that the dossier came from none other than a Clinton-backed group. We knew that these people would not give up when it came to trying to bring down the president, it is too bad that they are going to fail to discredit Trump again. As of right now, the Senate Judiciary Committee is working on getting subpoenas out on the research firm Fusion GPS. The company is remaining silent about the dossier and any involvement they might have had with it. All you have to do is take one look at the history of this research firm to know that Republicans are their primary target. Fusion GPS was hired by the Democrats to find information that could ruin Mitt Romney in 2012 and President Trump last year right before the election. Obviously, they have been up to no good for a long time, it is about time they get taken out of the picture. We cannot allow these people to continue this behavior. The Senate is planning to open an investigation into whether there was any direct communication between Fusion GPS and former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. We know that Lynch met with Bill Clinton to collude on Hillary Clinton's email scandal and that went off without a hitch. So what makes this any different? Interestingly enough, when talking about the Russia investigation, Congress, the CIA, and the FBI all pointed to this dossier as a source of information calling for a deeper investigation. They failed to mention that the founder of Fusion GPS has donated, at the very least, $1,000 to Clinton's foundation. Paul Sperry, who broke the story on Fox and Friends, said the dossier they provided had a ton of factually incorrect information as well as some extraordinarily questionable sources. We guess that it isn't too surprising considering they were working with the Clintons. What we see here, firsthand, is an attempt to take down our president using lies.
The fact that major intelligence committees are using documents full of holes to try and find out if the president was involved with Russia is shocking. Instead of believing the lies, why are they not worried that a Clinton support group put together a pamphlet of false information about not just this president, but many past candidates? It is unsettling to consider that these horrible people are trying to manipulate our elections to favor the left. We need to call these people out on what they are doing and make sure it never happens again. Fusion GPS should not have the power to fabricate documents and present them as facts to the people in our government. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Barack Obama caught, biggest scandal ever. At some point, most Americans realize that Barack Obama is running a shadow government. We've since learned the shocking things he has been doing for his own party. He abused our government for his own gain, for instance. Obama used the DOJ to shake down corporations for cash, giving it to progressive groups, and he used the IRS to persecute Tea Party groups. We also learned that he used the court systems to weaken private businesses, like the University of Phoenix, so his buddies could profit. Then there is the wholesale spying on American citizens by the NSA. Clearly, there are more than a few scandals he'd like to cover up, but we never truly realized the depths of what he was doing. And now, a national archivist drops a bombshell, thousands of documents have been destroyed. Something of this magnitude has never happened in the history of our country. From Western Journal the archivist in charge of transferring former President Barack Obama's records into the National Archives has run across a serious problem, according to a report published Sunday, a lot of the records are missing. Lipscomb wrote that the accumulation of recent congressional testimony has made it clear that the Obama administration itself engaged in the wholesale destruction and loss of tens of thousands of government records covered under the Act as well as the intentional evasion of the government records recording system by engaging in private email exchanges. And guess who else was involved, fellow citizens? So far, former President Obama, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, former Attorney General Lynch and several EPA officials have been named as offenders. I'm sure Obama, Clinton, and Lynch were destroying old cafe menus, right? not sensitive information that could point to their crimes. I mean, how can anyone defend these people at this point? We now know they were destroying government records. These documents were supposed to be saved digitally, but they were never digitized. And yet, Obama and Clinton made sure they were destroyed, anyway. Maybe they were trying to hide things from history. Scratch that, they definitely were. Lipscomb added, America's National Archives is facing the first major challenge to its historic role in preserving the records of the United States. That's pretty serious. For over 200 years, we've been able to preserve our history, that includes times of war, when our nation was at risk. Yet Obama and Clinton violated our traditions, laws, and government to cover their tracks. They destroyed documents that might have exposed their crimes. Worse still, they tried to erase a dark chapter of our history, a chapter when con artists and criminals ran the country. If this isn't proof of Obama's corruption, I don't know what is. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Barack Obama had his world turned upside down by this Trump decision. Barack Obama thought his legacy was secure. The swamp fought Donald Trump's every effort to undo his disastrous policies. But it didn't stop the president, and now Obama's world is about to be turned upside down by one Trump decision. Ever since taking office, Donald Trump has had his sights set on withdrawing from Obama's horrendous Iran nuclear deal. During the campaign, he declared it the worst deal ever. But once in office, globalist advisors and establishment swamp creatures attempted to box in the president. 
they claim the deal was in place and it would be too destructive to pull out. But that began to change in the fall when the president decertified the agreement. Now Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is telling people that he believes Trump will pull out of the deal in May. Axios reports. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told his security cabinet his assessment is that President Trump will most likely withdraw the U.S. from the Iran nuclear deal in May, according to two ministers WHO attended the meeting. The Bach drop, Netanyahu was briefing the security cabinet Sunday on his meeting with Trump earlier this month. He said Vice President Mike Pence, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and Chief of Staff John Kelly had all been present for the discussion on Iran. According to the two ministers, Netanyahu said in Sunday's meeting, I think Trump is very close to withdrawing from the Iran deal. The meeting was very important. Trump spoke in front of all the most senior members of his administration and told me that if the nuclear deal would not change significantly the U.S. will withdraw. The Prime Minister's office did not dispute this account but refrained from commenting on IT. Israeli officials say that the departure of Secretary of State Tirson is another sign that Trump is headed towards withdrawing from the Iran deal. They said Israel was very happy with the appointment of Mike Pompeo as the new Secretary of State mainly due to his hawkish views on Iran in general and especially on the Iran deal. The Iran deal was Obama's signature second-term achievement. Unfortunately the cost was high. His deal put Iran on the path to acquiring a nuclear weapon. It did not halt their weapons program. And it was sold under false pretenses. The Obama administration, led by Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes, planted fake news stories in the media about how the negotiations were emboldening moderates in Iran. But the Iran deal appears to be on the verge of being history. Do you think Trump should pull out of the Iran deal? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' news feeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Barack Obama's $48 million secret goes public. This is the end. Barack Obama is undoubtedly in full panic mode right now as his nasty $48 million secret has leaked to the public. The Washington Free Beacon reported that two sources have just come forward to say that in the final days of Obama's administration, a $48 million State Department grant to a for profit company for ID and other bomb removal services in Syria was rushed for approval. Just a few weeks into Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's tenure, this grant is receiving new internal State Department scrutiny as U.S. government officials try to flag key areas of concern that the new secretary can address. This kind of bombing and ordnance removal is known for being extremely dangerous, but also very necessary for the safety of returning communities displaced by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. The sources said that the grant was given to Tedder Attack an engineering services company that specializes in construction management and has much more limited experience in munitions and ordnance clearance than Janus and other foreign NGOs such as Halo Trust and for-profit companies such as Optima. The sources explain that officials in the U.S. State Department's Bureau Office worked to expedite a start date for Tetra Tech's side removal grant before January 19, 2017, the day before President Trump was inaugurated. There was a mad dash in the and NEA bureaus to get this done by January 19, said one source familiar with the internal State Department effort. They got the grant funded by December 29, 2016, and then got the internal paperwork finished by Jan.19, working in theater with the NEA Regional Bureau to lock this in. Patrick Kernan, a government contracting attorney who previously served as the chief of contract fiscal law for the multinational force in Iraq as a U.S. Army Judge Advocate General, said that a State Department agency providing a grant to a large, for-profit company is unusual and raises legal red flags. He explains that whether any laws were broken depends on internal paperwork and whether the officials involved precisely followed all the agency's grant rules. It 
sounds like a way to circumvent the strict sole source contracting the rules by pushing money into a grant process, which provides far less oversight than the regular contracts, he said in an email. It sounds like a pretty broad problem that needs some legislation to fix. What do you think about this? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Barack Obama's past comes back to haunt him, this is his worst nightmare. Liberals are currently trying to portray President Donald Trump as a monster for allowing children to be separated from their parents at the U.S. border. That's why they're desperately trying to hide the fact that these policies were actually started under Barack Obama. Back in 2015, The Washington Post reported that young Mexicans were being held for months without charge in shelters across the United States, sometimes without their parents' knowledge. Since the program began in May, 536 juveniles have been held, 248 of whom have been deported to Mexico after an average stay of 75 days, according to Border Patrol statistics, the Post reported. Liberals seem to have no problem with this back then, since they allowed Obama to get away with anything during his presidency. However, now that Trump is in office, the left is trying to use this to assassinate his character. Trump himself has often said that it is up to Democrats to fix what is happening at the border. It is the Democrats' fault for being weak and ineffective with border security and crime. Tell them to start thinking about the people devastated by crime coming from illegal immigration. Change the laws. Trump tweeted. Children are being used by some of the worst criminals on earth as a means to enter a country. Has anyone been looking at the crime taking place south of the border? It is historic with some countries the most dangerous places in the world. Not going to happen in the U.S. Trump tweeted earlier in the morning. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Bernie Sanders found guilty. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders just got the worst news of his life from the Federal Election Commission FEC. Right Wing News reported that the FEC fined Sanders $14,000 after they found him guilty for illegally accepting in-kind contributions from a foreign entity. This ruling was made due to a February 2016 conservative activist group Project Veritas video that showed Australian nationals working for the Sanders campaign while at the same time being paid by the Australian taxpayer-funded ALP. Republican and former New Hampshire House Speaker William O'Brien filed a complaint with the FEC immediately after the video was released. The FEC stated that the Australian volunteers engaged in political activities included encouraging voter attendance at campaign events, canvassing, planning events and recruitment of volunteers. The Sanders campaign treated the ALP delegates no differently from any other campaign out-of-town volunteers and was aware that they were receiving a stipend from the ALP, the FEC continued. A spokesman for Sanders released a statement saying that the campaign doesn't think it broke any rules. During the course of the campaign, thousands and thousands of young people from every state and many other countries volunteered. Among them were seven Australian young people who were receiving a modest stipend and airfare from the Australian Labour Party so they could learn about American politics, the spokesperson said. The folks on the campaign managing volunteers did not believe the stipend disqualified them from being volunteers. In order to avoid a long and expensive fight with the FEC over the technical status of these young people, the campaign agreed to pay the FEC a small settlement but did not agree that it broke any rules, the Sanders spokesperson added. Democrats like Sanders always seem to think that they are above the law, so we're glad to see that he is being held accountable for what he did. Share this story if you think Bernie Sanders got what he deserved. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content.
please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, biggest cover-up in history. New Benghazi scandal explodes over America. After months of news absence, Hillary Clinton appears again. But the news are definitely not in her favor, though. While some of the people believed hers and Obama's lies about Libya and Benghazi, the majority didn't. Everyone suspected that another play is taking place in the background, they just didn't know which. And of course, the Obama administration managed to pass without legal detection. If the justice system has forgotten, it doesn't mean that the people did. The people will never forget the murder of the four heroes, Chris Stevens, Sean Smith, Glenn Doherty, and Tyrone Woods. Judicial Watch recently attained a number of documents about Benghazi through a Freedom of Information Act request. And there is something outstanding in them. Judicial Watch published 54 pages of State Department files, which include a transcript of a phone conference call with Congress staff. In those files, the then Under Secretary of State for Management, Patrick Kennedy, said that the Benghazi attack was not under cover of protest, instead was a direct breaching attack. And what did the Obama administration say immediately after the attacks? It was a spontaneous attack that came out of spontaneous protests because of a YouTube video. But Patrick Kennedy doesn't seem to agree with their statement. He asserts completely the opposite. Kennedy also stated that the attack was semi-complex, adding that in it were used medium weapons, like RPGs and or mortars, which means that this wasn't just a careless attack, rather a prepared one. In the next four days, Susan Rice, during four Sunday talk shows, highlighted exactly the opposite of this. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Bill Clinton accuser breaks silence after decades. This is it. Bill Clinton is desperately trying to rehabilitate his image by distancing himself from the numerous allegations of sexual assault and harassment that have plagued him for decades. That's why he has gone into full panic mode after one of his accusers just came back to haunt him. Daily Mail reported that Jennifer Flowers, who had a 12-year affair with Clinton that nearly derailed his 1992 presidential campaign, now says that he sexually harassed her and called for him to be arrested for raping Juanita Broderick. Why shouldn't he be prosecuted for rape as Bill Cosby has, and Harvey Weinstein who was just arrested? Why shouldn't he be? Flowers asked during a Fox News appearance on Tuesday night. Flowers was referring to the 1977 rape of Broderick, who has said for decades that Clinton attacked her in a Little Rock hotel room. She also referred to Paula Jones and Kathleen Willey, two of his other accusers, as she mocked Clinton for being a huge abuser of the MeToo movement. I would like for the hashtag MeToo movement to be so kind as to recognize myself and Paula and Juanita and Kathleen and many, many other women, starting many years ago, that have come up with claims of sexual harassment from Bill Clinton, she said. They haven't given us any respect as far as I'm concerned. Earlier this week, Clinton claimed that he did not owe Monica Lewinsky an apology for their affair and that he was actually the victim of their scandal. Flowers, however, pointed out that he has never really faced legal consequences for anything that he has done. It just seems like that the Clintons are bulletproof, that it doesn't matter what they do, Flowers said. They seem to get away with things, and this would be another instance of that. He just, he hasn't been held accountable. Flowers also said that she only started dating Clinton after he sexually harassed her for a long period of time. I told him to knock it off. He proceeded to continue to come on to me for three months before I decided that I wanted to have a relationship with him, which at that point was consensual, she said. But in today's standards, and in hindsight, it was definitely sexual harassment. I was a little bit ashamed to admit that because in a way, I felt guilty because I was a willing participant, at a point. Back in 1977 when I met Bill, we didn't have the laws to protect us, Flowers added. We as women, we were, I was in the workplace of a man's world. I just had to do the best that I could.
share this story if you would like to see Bill Clinton face criminal charges. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' news feeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, bombshell, Barack Obama directly implicated in Trump Jr. scandal. The left-wing media has gone insane with the recent reports published by the New York Times regarding a 2016 meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and a Russian lawyer with ties to the Kremlin. Unfortunately for the left, the holes in this story are big enough to drive a boat through. The Russian lawyer in question, Natalia Vazelnitskaya, was given an all-clear by the Justice Department before engaging in a lobbying campaign in the Washington, D.C. This means that the woman at the center of the Trump-Russia conspiracy was allowed to work in the U.S. without a visa thanks to the Obama administration, via the Hill. Again, as much as the Democrats try to paint the Trump team as in the back pocket of Moscow, evidence always seems to point back to Obama, Clinton, or other high-ranking Democrats. Alan Dershowitz, a professor emeritus at the Harvard Law School and a noted liberal, has asserted that Donald Trump Jr. did not commit any crime if the only evidence is his email chain, via Fox News. Despite Tim Kaine's lunatic claim that Trump Jr. committed treason, getting dirt from a foreign national or a foreign government is not a crime. Vazelnitskaya herself has admitted that she is not connected to the Russian government at all. Vazelnitskaya also claims that she has never had or given dirt concerning Hillary Clinton, via The Guardian. Trump Jr. himself echoes these claims by saying the whole meeting amounted to a wasted 20 minutes. Another shocking revelation made by the alternative media concerns Vazelnitskaya's supposed pro-Trump bias. In the email chain released by Trump Jr. himself, an intermediary tried to portray the Russian lawyer as someone representing the Russian government and its interest in electing Trump as president. However, it turns out that Vazelnitskaya is a close associate of Glenn R. Simpson, the founder of Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS is the very same private intelligence agency that released the now-debunked Trump dossier claiming that Moscow's intelligence agents were blackmailing President Trump, via Got News. Vazelnitskaya is also an associate of Russian lobbyist Anatoly Semikornov, another figure linked to the Trump dossier and former MI6 agent Christopher Steele. This background makes one think that this whole meeting may have been a setup for the sake of a political smear. Finally, The Times admits that it published its reports without actually seeing the incriminating emails, they relied on three anonymous sources. One of the writers of the original article is none other than Maggie Haberman, a known Clinton loyalist and Democrat activist, via WikiLeaks. Considering all of this information, American patriots cannot but help to see this latest scandal as just another media contrivance. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' news feeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, bombshell, Barack Obama directly implicated in Trump Jr. scandal. The left-wing media has gone insane with the recent reports published by the New York Times regarding a 2016 meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and a Russian lawyer with ties to the Kremlin. Unfortunately for the left, the holes in this story are big enough to drive a boat through. The Russian lawyer in question, Natalia Vazelnitskaya, was given an all-clear by the Justice Department before engaging in a lobbying campaign in the Washington, D.C. This means that the woman at the center of the Trump-Russia conspiracy was allowed to work in the U.S. without a visa thanks to the Obama administration, via the Hill. Again, as much as the Democrats try to paint the Trump team as in the back pocket of Moscow, evidence always seems to point back to Obama, Clinton, or other high-ranking Democrats. Alan Dershowitz, a professor emeritus at the Harvard Law School and a noted liberal, has asserted that Donald Trump Jr. did not commit any crime if the only evidence is his email chain, via Fox News. Despite Tim Kaine's lunatic claim that Trump Jr. committed treason, getting dirt from a foreign national or a foreign government is not a crime. 
Vezelnitskaya herself has admitted that she is not connected to the Russian government at all. Vezelnitskaya also claims that she has never had or given dirt concerning Hillary Clinton, via The Guardian. Trump Jr. himself echoes these claims by saying the whole meeting amounted to a wasted 20 minutes. Another shocking revelation made by the alternative media concerns Veselnitskaya's supposed pro-Trump bias. In the email chain released by Trump Jr. himself, an intermediary tried to portray the Russian lawyer as someone representing the Russian government and its interest in electing Trump as president. However, it turns out that Veselnitskaya is a close associate of Glenn R. Simpson, the founder of Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS is the very same private intelligence agency that released the now-debunked Trump dossier claiming that Moscow's intelligence agents were blackmailing President Trump, via God News. Veselnitskaya is also an associate of Russian lobbyist Anatoly Semikornov, another figure linked to the Trump dossier and former MI6 agent Christopher Steele. This background makes one think that this whole meeting may have been a setup for the sake of a political smear. Finally, The Times admits that it published its reports without actually seeing the incriminating emails, they relied on three anonymous sources. One of the writers of the original article is none other than Maggie Haberman, a known Clinton loyalist and Democrat activist, via WikiLeaks. Considering all of this information, American patriots cannot but help to see this latest scandal as just another media contrivance. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, boom. Barack Obama just made sick admission. Former President Barack H. Obama visited Kenya last week. This was his first trip back to the country since leaving the Oval Office. During President Obama's years of the U.S. president, there were many accusations made against him claiming he wasn't born in the United States. Barack Obama claims he was born in Hawaii to a white female, and then raised by his white grandparents until he moved off for college in Chicago where he met Michelle Obama in the South Side. The accusations during Obama's term wasn't anything new to him. Previously. Barack Obama was accused of having a different religion back in 2004 when he was running for the U.S. Senate in Illinois. The accusations by frequent candidate for office, Andy Martin, spread to conservative publications, and many started questioning him on his values, cultural, and national loyalty, and by 2008, his citizenship. In 2008, National Review Online and National Review contributor Jim Garrity suggested Barack Obama release his birth certificate so the American people will know if he is, or isn't an American citizen. This sparked controversy, and accusations of racism starting against anyone who spoke out against the president and questioned his citizenship. During the same year, a Democratic State Committee member from Pennsylvania brought an unsuccessful lawsuit against Barack Obama that alleged Obama was born in Mombasa. Kenya. NPR shot themselves in the foot in 2008, when an article was published that referred to Barack Obama as the Kenyan-born Senator Barack Obama. On October 24, 2012 Donald J. Trump offered a $5 million donation to a charity of his choice if the president would release his college records, applications, his passport applications, and records. All that being said, Obama had a slip of the tongue during a speech in Kojilo, Kenya last week. Now, three years ago, I visited Kenya as the first sitting American president to come from Kenya, he said. There was a pause and then loud cheers and applause from the crowd after he made his remark at the 549 mark of the 15-minute speech. Recalling a visit to the country when he was president, Obama said, three years ago. I visited Kenya as the first sitting American president to come from Kenya. Obama didn't skip a beat, and he didn't take back the comment. He didn't say he made a mistake, and he didn't joke about what he said. He seemed to be on the up and up about it. Was he speaking the truth? From the heart? Let's go back to last year. In 2017, Obama's half-brother, Malik Obama, tweeted an image of what appears to be Barack's birth certificate. Except it's not from Hawaii, 
but rather Kenya. What's this? He tweeted. The document is from the Coast Province General Hospital in Mombasa, British Protectorate of Kenya, and is for Barack Hussein Obama too, who was born on the fourth day of August 1961. In 2011, the White House released what it claimed was President Obama's long-form birth certificate. The president believed the distraction over his birth certificate wasn't good for the country. It may have been good politics and good TV, but it was bad for the American people and distracting from the many challenges we face as a country. Therefore, the president directed his counsel to review the legal authority for seeking access to the long-form certificate and to request on that basis that the Hawaii State Department of Health make an exception to release a copy of his long-form birth certificate. American Mirror Obama's staff released this image of his Hawaii birth certificate, who knows if it was real or not. The question everyone should be asking right now why did Barack Obama admit he's from Kenya, and the media has yet to say anything about it? That's right, the media knew the truth the entire time but wanted to make sure Barack Obama stayed president of the United States so they could keep pushing their leftist agenda. Anyone who thinks Barack Obama's presidency wasn't planned years in advance is sadly mistaken. The Daily Mail reported that Barack Obama was still Kenyan-born in 2007 according to his literary agency two months after announcing his bid for the U.S. presidency. Barack Obama's literary agents were still listing the U.S. president's birthplace as Kenya in their online author bios two months after he first announced his run for president in 2007. Viewed on web.archive.org The April 3, 2007 listing from Acton and Die Still for Mr. Obama still touts the then-Democratic junior senator from Illinois as born in Kenya. Indeed, the short biography even references his now-famous speech to the Democratic National Convention which launched Mr. Obama to national fame and announced him as a potential candidate for the presidency. However, the next available listing online at web.archive.org is from April 21, 2007, and the future president's biography has changed to state that Barack Obama was born in Hawaii and not Kenya. By the time the biography was changed Mr. Obama had been sitting in the U.S. Senate for two years. This new information comes as the row over Mr. Obama's heritage was reunited by the discovery of a 1991 booklet boldly announcing that the Democrat was born in Kenya and raised in Indonesia and Hawaii. The truth will always come out. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, bombshell evidence surfaces in Hillary email case, media panicking. The DNC leaks were, undoubtedly, the second most talked about event of last year, only behind Donald Trump winning the election from the Shillery. News just released regarding the leaks. Dems should be running and hiding. An IT specialist who goes by the name the Faran Cicator likely a cover to keep himself safe from retaliation on the left released an interesting and detailed report that proves that the DNC was not hacked by Russia. It was an inside job all along. Just a mere five days before Seth Rich was murdered, the DNC emails were copied locally not remotely. You might be wondering why this is so important. Think about it for a second. The proven upload speed of the data transfer was 23 megabytes per second, Mbps. It would be impossible to transfer data that quickly unless you were either a on a LAN in the surrounding networks or b on the computer where the files were being stored. The chance of them being copied from outside of the DNC, let alone in other country, are slim to none. Knowing what we know now also lends credibility to the proof that Seth Rich was murdered for turning on his own party and getting the emails stored on a flash drive. Internet hacker Kim.com admitted that he worked with an agent named Panda to release the documents. He explains that Panda gave him a lot of information about the DNC, voter fraud, and other areas of politics that the Dems would like to keep us from knowing. Kim explains on multiple outlets how he was connected to Seth Rich aka Panda. They worked together, and Seth is the one who had to grab the files from the DNC. Sadly, Rich was murdered and now the reason seems pretty clear.
the fall Iran cicadas report has plenty of other information that ties everything together and shows that there is nowhere else this information could have come from, except for the building where it was stored. According to the Gateway Pundit, Eastern Daylight Time settings were on in the computer system where the files were pulled from, demonstrating that this had to take place somewhere on the East Coast. Additionally, the 23 Mbps data transfer really narrows it down to where this took place. The point is, this story is becoming unraveled right before our very eyes. The Democrats have been lying, and people in high places had Seth Rich murdered for exposing the truth. It may be a slow process, but soon everything will be revealed, and some powerful people are going to have to answer some hard questions. They were able to murder poor Seth Rich, but once everyone gets together and confronts them, there is nothing they can do. We will get justice for Rich. He grabbed those documents because he knew how corrupt the DNC was and he felt it was his duty to expose the truth. Disturbingly enough, the DNC staff spoke about making examples of people who crossed the DNC or HRC. You can read that leaked email here. Rich is a hero in that regard. If we didn't have the information from him, we may very well still be grasping at straws. Once this is all said and done, people are going to jail for the rest of their lives. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking Chelsea Clinton hit with devastating blow. The Clintons are so corrupt that Chelsea Clinton cannot even write a book without being sued. Author Christopher Kimberly has filed a lawsuit accusing Chelsea Clinton of stealing his ideas for her new book. She persisted. He is seeking $150,000 in damages, in addition to any profits the book generates, via Daily Mail. The author is suing the former first daughter and her publisher, Penguin Random House, for ripping off the stories from a book he pitched to Penguin Young Readers US in 2013. She Persisted is a feminist children's book aimed at kids between the ages of 4 and 8. It features quotations and stories of successful women who managed to succeed in the face of adversity. Back in 2013, Christopher Kimberly pitched his book, A Heart is the Part That Makes Boys and Girls Smart, intended to target young boys and girls. The author claims that the publisher ignored his original pitch and used it as the outline that Chelsea Clinton could not have written herself. Both books feature quotations and stories from the lives of Harriet Tubman and Nellie Bly. At least 13 quotes contained in Kimberly's book were used by Chelsea Clinton. Kimberly immediately noticed similarities between his book and the children's book promoted by Chelsea Clinton. He immediately filed a cease and desist notice. However, Chelsea Clinton continued to promote the book up to its release and since, the feminist children's book has spent five weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Kimberly made his version of the book available for free online for anyone to compare. The children's book was written for Chelsea Clinton as the former first daughter prepares to launch her new political career. Chelsea's foray into politics has been moving at an advanced pace since the Clinton family is desperate to gain more influence to peddle. The corrupt apple does not fall too far from the tree and Chelsea Clinton, like her parents, is happy to break the law and step on the little people to advance her career. Hopefully, the people of New York are wise enough to prevent another Clinton from becoming a senator. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Chelsea Clinton just got sued in federal court. She is screwed. The Clintons are so corrupt that Chelsea Clinton cannot even write a book without being sued. Author Christopher Kimberly has filed a lawsuit accusing Chelsea Clinton of stealing his ideas for her new book. She persisted. He is seeking $150,000 in damages, in addition to any profits the book generates, via Daily Mail. The author is suing the former first daughter and her publisher, Penguin Random House, for ripping off the stories from a book he pitched to Penguin Young Readers US in 2013. 
She Persisted is a feminist children's book aimed at kids between the ages of 4 and 8. It features quotations and stories of successful women who managed to succeed in the face of adversity. Back in 2013, Christopher Kimberly pitched his book, I Heart is the Part That Makes Boys and Girls Smart, intended to target young boys and girls. The author claims that the publisher ignored his original pitch and used it as the outline that Chelsea Clinton could not have written herself. Both books feature quotations and stories from the lives of Harriet Tubman and Nellie Bly. At least 13 quotes contained in Kimberly's book were used by Chelsea Clinton. Kimberly immediately noticed similarities between his book and the children's book promoted by Chelsea Clinton. He immediately filed a cease and desist notice. However, Chelsea Clinton continued to promote the book up to its release and since. The feminist children's book has spent five weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Kimberly made his version of the book available for free online for anyone to compare. The children's book was written for Chelsea Clinton as the former first daughter prepares to launch her new political career. Chelsea's foray into politics has been moving at an advanced pace since the Clinton family is desperate to gain more influence to peddle. The corrupt apple does not fall too far from the tree and Chelsea Clinton, like her parents, is happy to break the law and step on the little people to advance her career. Hopefully, the people of New York are wise enough to prevent another Clinton from becoming a senator. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Clintons admit guilt for nasty crime, media covering it up. The Clinton crime family remains free from consequence as the mainstream media continues to ignore the crimes of the Democrat Party. The Clintons were forced to admit that the Clinton Foundation accepted a $1 million donation from Qatar and lied to cover it up. Qatar offered the massive sum while Hillary Clinton was serving as Secretary of State. Via Daily Wire Both Hillary and Bill Clinton were forced to sign an ethics agreement when Hillary was appointed as Secretary of State. The agreement required the power couple to disclose all new foreign donations. Hillary Clinton was asked to lead the State Department in 2009. The Clinton Foundation made a full list of their donors available in 2010. However, the foundation has refused to provide a full list of donors for any year after 2010, in clear violation of the ethics agreement they signed. The Clintons refused to disclose their full donor list because the Clinton Foundation began accepting donations from foreign governments in exchange for influence with the newly appointed Secretary of State. Foreign governments could only gain access to the Hillary Clinton and the power of the State Department by making massive donations to the Clinton Slush Fund, which is disguised as a global charity. In 2011, the Islamic government of Qatar donated $1 million to the foundation to celebrate Bill Clinton's birthday. In exchange, government officials bought face time with the Clintons in New York. Clinton Foundation officials admitted that they failed to reach the requirements of the ethics agreement. However, they blamed the lapse on an oversight. The foundation has yet to provide a complete list of donors who provided funding to Hillary Clinton's charity while she, pretended to, served the American people. Typically, violating an ethics agreement with the federal government and accepting millions in a pay-to-play scheme would generate outrage in the media, and spawn investigations in Congress. Unfortunately, the Clinton crime family remains immune from consequence as they continue to sell at the American people. The Washington elites have developed a two-tier justice system where the rich and powerful are immune from consequence. Hillary Clinton can get away with crimes that would lock average Americans up for life. President Trump needs to name a special prosecutor at once. It's a scandal, and Hillary Clinton is still walking free. We need to make an example of the evil power broker. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Comey's horrifying crime discovered, time for jail. 
the James Comey story just took a very interesting turn. The former FBI director, whose firing by President Donald Trump became a cause celebre among leftists, might have incriminated himself with his many leaked memos. As it turns out, more than half of Comey's infamous memos contained classified information. Ironically, it seems that Comey, who leaked many of these memos to a friend in the Columbia Law School, broke the same rules as former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, via The Hill. In total, Comey composed seven memos about his meetings with President Trump regarding the ongoing investigation into Russian interference during the 2016 election. Four of these memos contain information that had not been cleared for public consumption. President Trump's administration has reacted to this news by declaring that Comey's actions are illegal, via Fox News. In late June, news broke that a Senate intelligence panel would be assigned with reviewing Comey's memos. It is uncertain if this panel is the one who declared that Comey's memos broke several departmental rules within the FBI, via Chicago Tribune. Last October, Comey was the key official who stated that Hillary Clinton would not be charged for disseminating classified information via her personal email server. Although Comey agreed that Clinton had broken several laws, he decided not to pursue charges against the leading Democrat based on her intentions. Comey broke legal precedent by claiming that Clinton did not intend on breaking any federal laws, therefore would not be charged. Later, during his testimony before Congress, Comey admitted that Obama-era Attorney General Loretta Lynch told him to call the FBI's investigation into Clinton's email server as matter. Such rhetorical theatrics were intended to minimize public outcry. Ultimately, Lynch's subterfuge undermined the FBI's independence, via New York Times. After these revelations regarding Comey's leaked memos, the former FBI director may find himself in the same position as Clinton. The jury remains out if Trump's FBI will pursue criminal charges against Comey. It is similarly unknown if a new FBI director will follow Comey's logic. This most recent Comey snag may be part of a larger offensive against the shadowy leak army that is currently at work inside of the American intelligence community. Right now, reports indicate that the Trump administration is coming down hard on suspected leakers, while simultaneously restricting access to classified material via Politico. Hopefully, Comey will face the music for his many indiscretions. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Congress makes criminal charges announcement in Hillary email scandal. House Oversight Committee Chairman Jason Chaffetz, RUT, is not giving up the fight against Hillary Clinton. He is determined to see all those involved brought to justice. Rep. Chaffetz is seeking to put criminal charges on Brian Pagliano, the State Department employee who helped set up Clinton's private server during her time as Secretary of State, via Fox News. The Republican representative wrote a letter to newly sworn in Attorney General Jeff Sessions this Thursday to ask him to convene a grand jury to charge Brian Pagliano. Pagliano refused to follow the orders of two subpoenas that mandated he appear in front of the GOP-led Oversight Committee. They later held a vote that found him in contempt of Congress. Earlier in the month, Chaffetz spoke with Trump in the Oval Office, and they decided not to talk about oversight. Chaffetz has not held the requests of investigations into Trump's businesses and the alleged conflicts of those businesses for consideration. In a statement, Chaffetz stated that allowing Pagliano's actions to go unaddressed would gravely harm Congress's ability to conduct oversight. Of course, the Democrats disagree. Maryland Rep. Elijah Cummings believes that pursuing these charges would be a waste of both time and money, but he would surely support an investigation into Trump which would actually be a waste of time and money. Apparently, Chairman Chaffetz and President Trump are the only two people in Washington today who think we should still be investigating Secretary Clinton, Cummings stated. The Oversight Committee can't afford to be distracted by political vendettas against Hillary Clinton while our constituents are begging us to conduct responsible oversight of President Trump. So, 
the Democrats would have Clinton get away with her crimes? Liberals used to argue that the email scandal was just a way to undermine Clinton's run for presidency. Clearly, they were wrong since Clinton lost, and honorable Republicans are still trying to hold her accountable for what she's done. Pagliano had been a very troubling character during the investigations. In 2015, Pagliano refused to cooperate with the House panel's questioning about the horrible 2012 Benghazi attack, which left four American heroes dead. Later, he spoke to the FBI with immunity, saying there were no successful breaches of security into Clinton's personal server. However, he said he was aware that there were several failed login attempts on the server, which he called brute force attacks. This is where a hacker retries entering a password until all possible letter and number combinations have been tried. As the Angry Patriot previously reported, the FBI has since acted under the assumption that some foreign entities did gain access to the server. The Republicans were determined to make sure Clinton was not elected into the White House, focusing on the use of the private server for government business, which no political operative should be doing, especially someone looking to become president. FBI Director James Comey ruled that Clinton's action with her computer server were merely extremely careless, but this statement was condemned by both Republicans and Democrats. The Dems saw it as unnecessary editorializing, and the Republicans saw it as a belittlement of Clinton's crimes. Chaffetz is right to set his sights on Pagliano. Soon, it will be Hillary Clinton's head on the chopping block. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Breaking, Congress to formally investigate Obama for treason. Lock him up. We may finally get some answers regarding former President Obama's shady behavior while he was in office. He needs to be arrested for treason. Leaders of the House Oversight Committee came forward and demanded answers into whether the Obama administration disregarded the U.S. effort to keep weapons out of the hands of dangerous Iranian trafficking networks during the nuclear deal with Iran, via Politico. They're also trying to determine whether or not the Obama administration jeopardized our national security in his dealings with Tehran. The Obama administration misled the true patriots of this country when they disclosed the terms of that deal. Clearly, there is more here than meets the eye. The Obama administration has proven to us time and time again that they are not to be trusted. They would be perfectly willing to sacrifice an American life in the name of looking good in the eyes of misinformed voters. It is truly disturbing. If you want to know just how uncomfortable the left is with full disclosure, just look at their reactions to WikiLeaks' dump of information on Hillary's email server scandal. They lost IT. We had political hacks all over TV telling us we couldn't read Hillary's emails because they were illegal. However, the media were allowed to read the emails, and they reported lies and nothing of practical use to us. That left a bad taste in our mouths. We thought transparency was something that was good for our country. Apparently, the left disagrees. Our country stands to benefit from free and transparent governing and reporting. The Trump administration has been extremely transparent and effective. President Trump doesn't rely on underhanded media manipulation tactics like the Obama administration did. We need this kind of transparency in our offices. We cannot be expected to vote and make educated political choices without being properly informed. It's almost like the left doesn't want us to see what they're hiding. Republican leaders on Capitol Hill have questions about the Iran deal, and have very good reason to believe we've been lied to. In a letter to Jeff Sessions jointly drafted by 13 Republican senators, the senators penned, We write to request your assistance in providing Congress with more information regarding the Obama administration's decision to drop the charges or convictions in the 21, Iran deal, cases via all sides. That is a very troubling problem. It stands to reason these senators know they're onto something, otherwise they wouldn't be pooling their resources together to track down this information. We're going to be in great shape once they get a hold of that information and show us the truth. Do you think Obama was America's most corrupt president? Let America know. 
show underscore poll poll underscore it equals 36237. The half-truths and full-on deception are over. We are not going to sit here and be lied to by former administration, and neither is President Trump. The truth will be exposed. When it finally happens, victory is going to be sweet. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, death link to Clinton shakes Democrat Party. Hillary Clinton has earned herself the nickname Killary, due to the astonishing number of individuals who have died suspiciously after coming into contact with her. Well, it looks like there is another person we can tack onto that list. The Miami Herald reports that Klaus Eberwein, a former Haitian government official, was found dead in his hotel from what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The most damning thing about his death is that he was said to soon testify against the Clinton Foundation in regards to the way the funds raised for Haiti were handled by the fraud-filled organization. Eberwein was found dead on July 11, and his cause of death was instantly ruled as a suicide. However, the former government official has said, on multiple occasions, that he believes the Clinton Foundation is nothing more than a bunch of criminals. There are even records of him telling his friends and family that he feared for his life, due to the way that he called out Hillary Clinton in the money-gathering machine that is the Clinton Foundation. World Net Daily reports that his testimony was scheduled for next Tuesday. Eberwein was scheduled to speak to the Haitian Senate Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission about how the Clinton Foundation misappropriated Haiti earthquake relief funds, particularly from international donors. His feelings about the organization were clear. He once shouted, The Clinton Foundation, they are criminals, they are thieves, they are liars, they are a disgrace, while protesting outside of the building where the foundation is based in New York City. Had he been allowed to live long enough to testify, this is the mind-blowing figure that would have blown the foundation out of the water, only 0.6% of the billions raised by the foundation went to help with relief efforts. In typical fashion, the Clintons were pocketing the money and distributing the rest how they saw fit. It is disturbing, for sure, but not as disturbing as setting up murder plots to stop people from catching on to your scam. There is something sinister brewing in the Clinton Foundation. Hillary has been allowed to get away with this kind of behavior for years. There are too many people related to her that are now dead. This cannot be mere coincidence. We need to start following the threads here. Before Eberwein, Seth Rich was the last person suspected of being murdered by Hillary, likely someone she paid to do it and keep her hands clean. If we keep looking and digging, the truth will come out. Once that day comes, and Hillary is behind bars, she will never see the light of day again. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking Dem Congressman Makes Sick Move Against Trump Democrats are still trying to discredit Trump, pointing to conflicts of interest liberals will not drop. One congressman just discovered something new to use against Trump. New York Democrat Rep. Gerald Nadler just filed a resolution of inquiry which is something that can be used against presidents to force them and the agencies of the executive branch to share their records with Congress, via the Washington Post. The common practice that follows this inquiry is a resolution, one that has to be debated and then called into action in committee or else be discharged to the House for consideration on the floor. This resolution will ask Jeff Sessions, the newly sworn in Attorney General, to give copies of any document, record, memo correspondence, or other communication of the Department of Justice relating to criminal or counterintelligence investigation that looks into Donald Trump. It also calls for Sessions to look into Trump's team of associates in the White House and his presidential campaign as well as investments made by foreign agents or powers in his businesses. They also want to look at Trump's step back from his businesses and any conflict of interest Trump is associated fault with. 
Nadler is the second-ranked Democrat in the Judiciary Committee, and he claimed his resolution comes after Democrats sent two letters to the chairman of the committee, Bob Goodlett, RVA, and to House Speaker Paul Ryan, RY, to look into Trump's financial records. All of this demands investigation, and of course they've refused, Nadler stated on Thursday at the House Democrats' policy retreat held annually. This resolution will force them to confront the issue. This resolution also calls for information outside of Donald Trump, asking for the records of now former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort, Trump's campaign manager prior to Kellyanne Conway, and Carter Page, a campaign advisor to Trump and a consultant in the oil industry. The resolution also calls for looking into the records of Roger Stone, a political agent, as well as any employee of the executive office of the president. These four men, like Trump, are suspected by Democrats to have alleged ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Trump has stepped back from managing his businesses, signing them over to his family to run and maintain, but he hasn't divested his assets as of yet. Both he and Putin have denied having deals with each other, but the Democrats continue to cry wolf. Resolutions like this have been given to Congress many times throughout America's history, but it's usually by members of the party that isn't in the White House. Most of them deal with sensitive issues in the political world, but this is the first that straight out attacked a president. This is yet another Democrat ploy to try to discredit and ruin Trump, hoping to find some skeletons in his closet, yet looking into Hillary Clinton's closet was seen as vindictive. What do the Democrats call this? They are mad that they lost control of this country and are scrambling to get it back in any way they can. It's despicable. It is nothing more than another plot to discredit Trump and put Dems back in charge, but we the people will not let that happen. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share it to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Democrat hacking scandal explodes, people are going to prison. Democrats are desperately protecting and the media is dutifully ignoring the Pakistani family who stole millions from taxpayers while working for House Democrats. Capitol Police are investigating the Awan brothers for their possible involvement in extortion, tax fraud, insurance fraud and bankruptcy fraud as well as other crimes. Police worry that the money was funneled overseas, possibly to sponsor terrorism, via the Daily Caller. Imran Awan, his two brothers Zabid and Jamal, and his wife Hina, worked as IT aides for Congressional Democrats until Capitol Police blocked them from accessing the government computer network. Since 2009, the Awan family has netted over $4 million from taxpayers while being paid top dollars as IT staffers for the Democrats. However, discrepancies indicated that the Awans barely worked at all. The brothers made many long trips to their home country of Pakistan while on the Democrats' payroll, leading many to assume they were ghost employees. Imran did much of the work on Capitol Hill and his family members were only employed to circumvent rules limiting the pay of congressional staffers. Imran Awan was employed by as many as 30 Democrats and did little IT work for any of them. All the while, he and his family members were stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of computer equipment and classified data. The Awans rose to prominence after Imran obtained a job with W. Wasserman Schultz in 2005. The brothers were able to spread their influence across the Democrat Party while working for the prominent politician. It was later revealed that Imran had access to Schultz's iPad containing classified information. The Democrats have vehemently defended the actions of these crooks, leading many to think the Awans are blackmailing Democrats. One IT aide working in Washington remarked, If I was accused of a tenth of what these guys are accused of, they'd take me out in handcuffs that same day and I'd never work again, adding, I don't know what they have, but they have something on someone, via the Daily Caller. While the Awans were making millions off House Democrats, they were also engaging in fraudulent businesses and schemes in Virginia. The brothers owned a fake used car a lot and owned a network of rental properties that they failed to disclose. Despite the numerous sources of income, 
they at once all live in modest houses and drive modest cars, leading Capitol Police to assume the money is being funneled overseas and financing unknown organizations. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you, Breaking Democrats' Sturdy Little Secret Exposed Bernie Sanders managed to capture the hearts of millennials everywhere with his promises of free health care and college. Now, long after being bought out by Clinton, it looks like Sanders is finally starting to fill the burn. A recent interview shows Sanders becoming irate when asked about whether or not his wife, Jane Sanders, committed fraud. The Washington Free Beacon reports that Jane Sanders illegally obtained a multi-million dollar bank loan to fix up the school that she was the head of, Burlington College in Vermont. Bernie used his political influence to secure the loan, and now that this information is coming to light he is not happy. The couple decided to seek legal help after they being probed for allegations of bank fraud. Now that this information is out in the open, Sanders becomes furious when asked about the case. It is pathetic that he cannot even defend himself or his wife without throwing a temper tantrum. Bernie's reaction is mind-numbing, to say the least. You would think that if you and your wife were accused of fraud, regardless of the circumstances, you would want to defend both yourself and your wife. You would defend yourself with logic, not by ignoring the question and attacking another topic. Sanders rudely interrupted the person asking the question and starting insulting Trump's campaign and rambling about health care. It is a clear and obvious case of deflection. Sanders knows he is in hot water and all he can do now is cook. The best he can do is to turn down the heat by deflecting to topics in the media that are not relevant to the situation at hand. Apparently, it is okay to investigate President Trump on false claims but do not ever dream of investigating Bernie or Jane Sanders. I mean, they are the most honest person he knows. It is laughable that Sanders thinks that telling us how honest his wife is is a good substitution for a criminal investigation. How about you let the people who see signs of deception do their job? Apparently, he fears getting busted. It explains why he is so defensive. When you watch him, he is not defensive in an honest way, either. Bernie is defensive in the way that a child is when you catch them with chocolate on their mouth while they deny touching the cookie jar. Justice is going to be served, and it is going to be sweet. The evidence is already starting to present itself that there was a crime of some sort going on here. It is looking like Jane lied about the number of pledges she had acquired to help pay back the multi-million dollar loan. She likely went in and presented the false figures in the hopes of getting more money, and it worked. You had better believe that Bernie was there helping out during the conversation with the bank too. Something seems awfully fishy about this story. We cannot wait until it is torn wide open and exposed to the entire country. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Hillary busted as Trump visa target confesses. Carter Page went on with Tucker Carlson on Monday to discuss the release of the FISA court documents used to spy on the Trump campaign. Carter Page was spied on by the Obama regime despite never even meeting the Russian officials he was accused of dealing with in the junk steel dossier. Carter Page it's funny in July of 2016, two months before the Yahoo News article came out I started getting these calls from various news reporters, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, all asking me about these same two names of people I've never even heard of, I've heard of Sachin, I never even heard of, Igor, Diveken. So it was obvious. Some people told me from the media they heard it from the Clinton campaign, etc. Carter Page denied this weekend that he ever discussed lifting Western sanctions with Igor Sachin, a high-ranking Russian official. Page never even met the guy. But he was spied on anyway by the criminal Obama regime. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, 
however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you. Breaking, Hillary's illegal plot to remove Trump from office just exposed. You'd think that, after somebody quit working for the government, the government would cut ties with them, right? Not the deep state. Months after her election loss, and at the end of her political career, Hillary Clinton and her staff still have security clearance. She's using this clearance to leak damaging information, and outright lies. Her goal is to undermine President Trump, and she still hopes to get him impeached. Vi Breitbart This is even worse than it sounds. Hillary Clinton is under investigation, and has a horrible, horrible track record with classified material. Who in their right mind wouldn't strip her of her clearance? I suppose Clinton still has some loyal minions at the State Department who are too implicated in her crimes to refuse her access to the department. When asked, the State Department said it isn't allowed to mention whether staff, or former staff, have security clearance. But Senator Chuck Grassley, R. E. Yeah, is keeping us as informed as he can. He's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and confirmed that the investigation into Clinton's mishandling of classified information has been reopened. Clinton's spokesperson, Nick Merrill, has arrogantly attested to the opposite, saying, nothing's been more thoroughly dissected. It's over. Case closed. Literally. Right. Clinton, and the rest of us, can insist the case is over when she's rotting in jail. No one will believe a thing she says about it from a cell. It's a wonder that anyone believes anything Clinton's aides say, either. I suppose they frequently disguise their identities, hiding behind the media's famous anonymous source moniker. You know someone is lying when they don't want you to know who they are. I think, deep down, they know that openly putting their necks out for Clinton is going to land them in a jail cell, or on the list of mysterious deaths. The only thing more volatile than Hillary Clinton is a bitter Hillary Clinton. The sooner we lock her up, the less damage she, and her aides, can do. Facebook has greatly reduced the distribution of our stories in our readers' newsfeeds and is instead promoting mainstream media sources. When you share to your friends, however, you greatly help distribute our content. Please take a moment and consider sharing this article with your friends and family. Thank you.